Hi everyone, I'm Maggie McGrath, Senior Editor at Forbes. In German state elections this weekend, the AFD, or Alternative for Germany Party, became the first far-right party in Germany to win a state election since 1945. Here to explain these results and what it means for German politics is Liana Fix. She's a fellow covering Europe for the Council on Foreign Relations. Liana, thank you so much for being here. It's my pleasure. Thank you for the invite. So let's start by translating these elections for the American audience. Who voted and what exactly were these elections? What parts of the country voted and was it the whole country? So it was not the whole country. We had two regional elections. Basically, we have 16 states in Germany and that built the Federal Republic. And two of those in the eastern part have voted. There will be one more in the eastern part of Germany. And why is it relevant that the eastern part votes? It is relevant because of the eastern part of Germany. Since reunification in 1990, we have seen a tendency of voting differently than West Germany and often voting the much more um, in, in, a, in a much greater numbers for populist movements from the left wing and this time from the extreme right or the alternative for Germany, which is not only a populist right wing party, it is in reality uh, an extreme right wing party, which is observed by the German domestic intelligence uh, service in those regional states. Extreme right wing party. Let's let's break that down because there are multiple political parties in Germany, unlike in the US, where we basically have Democrats, Republicans, maybe some independents, maybe some Green Party. So what is the typical distribution of the political parties in Germany? So usually we have a very strong center, which consists of um, the social dem of four parties, the social democrats, the conservatives, the liberals, and the greens. And the problem is that we had a proliferation of parties in Germany in the last decade. So the green party came in addition. And then we have on the left wing and on the right wing fringes, the left wing populists and the right wing populists and extremists. So we have six parties. And the problem now in Eastern Germany is that the right wing extremist AFD has become so strong that it is almost impossible for those four parties in the center to build a coalition without the extremists. And what is most interesting is that the extremist AFD, I mean, there are many populist right wing parties in Europe that we hear about, but the AFD in Germany, in contrast to many other right wing populist parties in Europe, has not tried to become more mainstream. They have not tried to appeal as dangerous. They have actually radicalized over the negatives since the last two years, since the pandemic, since Russia's war against Ukraine. And despite this radicalization, they have received a record outcome in these two regional elections in Eastern Germany. In spite of radicalization, is it in fact the radicalization that is driving voters to vote for this far right party? Or if not the radicalization, what is the reason that voters voted in such strength for the AFD? So now one can argue, well, it's only Eastern Germany. And Eastern Germany, since unification, have all, has always been um, well, the, 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 the small sister, which didn't get the same kind of advantages in the family. There were a lot of economic deprivation since German uh, reunification. A lot of young, educated people moved out from Eastern Germany. But we also see increasing levels of voters for the right wing extremists in Western Germany, not as extreme as in East Germany, but especially in the South and Bavaria, we also see an increase of these numbers. And this has actually started with the pandemic, but it has increased with Russia's war against Ukraine and the long term consequences of that inflation rising um, concerns about war in Europe. Those are all those topics that the right wing extremists, but also left wing populists are successfully picking up and making the case to stop Ukraine support, to stop immigration and to return to a more traditional uh, societal understanding of how we live together together. You mentioned immigration. How big of an issue was immigration in this election? It was a big issue because there are two strands of immigration in Germany right now. The one is the Ukrainian refugees, which are not considered as asylum seekers. They receive social benefits through the EU because they were considered 
um, uh, those who suffered from the war that's really next door to Europe. And we have asylum seekers coming also to la from la the large parts of Syria, from Afghanistan. And there the debate is different. There there's a big concern that Germany, but also in Europe in general, are not able to control this migration. And we've seen the numbers rising up two levels of 2015, 2016, when Angela Merkel, the former German chancellor, famously said, we can do this, we will keep the doors open. Right now, the feeling in Germany is, and that is a consensus across Germany, that um, this can-do mentality in terms of migration um, is, is, is not feasible anymore. Now, in the wake of the election results, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz said, uh, our country cannot and must not get used to this. He also said the AFD is damaging Germany. How widespread is that belief? Is that what the wide and most common reaction to these results is? The AFD is damaging Germany. It's damaging those regional um, states that actually need skilled workers and skilled migrant workers, but are now concerned that those workers are not moving to a state where extreme right wing party has gained 30% of the vote or even more. So it has a direct economic impact. But then on the other hand, what Chancellor Scholz did not say is that the dissatisfaction with his own government also contributed to the rise of the AFD. He is leading a three party progressive liberal, liberal government that has not delivered on its promises and that has received results in the European Union elections in June, but also in the regional elections that were damaging, that were catastrophic for his government. And instead of self-criticism, um, he is uh, not he, he's not making the case what he could do better, especially with regard to the German federal elections, the national nationwide elections next year. That's interesting. So you said these regional election results are catastrophic to his government. How does this change the way he governs over the next year? Well, honestly, it can only get worse. The problem so far has been that the three party coalition had been held together by promises they made to their respective constituencies, expecting budgetary flexibility. Now, the budget is much more tight than they expected it to be. And so this coalition is basically fighting each other for a long time, which uh, the voters in Germany really don't appreciate. Um, and the concern is that this coalition may not survive until the next parliamentary elections in Germany next year because they're so unpopular and they're really only held together by a sense of surviving um, these uh, the, the, the catastrophic um, uh, opinion polls that, that they receive. If you look at the voters who voted in this regional election and the outcomes that we're seeing, what do you think will be the day-to-day -day impact going forward? Will there be a change in policy that they've wanted to see in their region or a change in politics in those regions? What, what do we know about the politicians who won and what they will do for those constituents? Well, paradoxically, the AFD always tries, the extreme right wing AFD always tries to portray itself as being beneficial to those voters who are struggling financially and economically. But their policies, if you look at their program, is actually benefiting much more um, the richer parts of society. They want tax cuts for the richer parts of society. They want to cut down on social welfare. So um, the AFD um, is for those parts of the population, it will not bring any any relief. Then there's obviously the impact on migration policies that we will see, probably not a welcoming attitude to refugees in those regional states. But there, it might also have an effect of blocking national policies because the states in Germany have a right to and have a say in national policies. And on the overall level, just within Europe, having received these catastrophic results, Olaf Scholz's government will appear to many as a lame duck in the year ahead. Lame duck in the year ahead. And then you mentioned the 2025 elections across all of Germany. What do you think the impact of these regional elections will be? And will it affect the way that the center, center left, and left coalitions present themselves to German voters? 
It will most certainly have an effect on the national elections. First of all, it is to be expected the governing coalition of Olaf Scholz will really struggle to remain in power. We see that the Conservatives, Angela Merkel's former party, is much more popular and they are much more likely to, uh, to, to, to win the elections as of now. But what we also see is that the left-wing populists and the right-wing extremists really make it so difficult to build a coalition in Germany. And in contrast to the United States, where you don't need to build a coalition, this coalition building is so important. If you have too many parties and too many of the smaller part, all parties are small parties with a significant vote share, it becomes incredibly difficult to build a working coalition. And that is a challenge that we will um, also see in the next elections and we will continue to see in the regional elections to the extent that even left-wing populists and conservatives have to build a coalition even though they have nothing in common just to avoid that the extreme AFD, the extreme right wing party becomes to power because that's a lesson of German history. No one wants to see the right wing AFD in power in Germany, not on a regional level and most certainly not on a federal level. That's interesting. Is there a parallel to what just happened in the French elections and the SNAP elections? But in terms of how the parties shook out there and in Germany? Yeah, interestingly, the French are much more open to these surprises at the election. That's not something that German voters really appreciate. German voters want to have stability. They don't want a sudden election in three weeks, which is one of the reasons why the act the current governing coalition of Olaf Scholz might actually survive because German voters don't appreciate early elections um, and no one in the German political system has the courage to do the kind of political gambling that Macron did. Right-wing parties also gained ground in the European parliamentary elections earlier this summer. As you look at the results from kind of a wider lens from June until now, what does this say to you about voter sentiment in Europe and just where the region is heading more broadly? So across Europe, it's interesting that we do see a rise of right-wing populist parties in certain countries, um, as in France, for example. But those right-wing populist parties are much more willing to work together with the central mainstream party. So we do see coalitions of right-wing populists with centrist parties. We do see coalitions of only right-wing populists, like in Italy. We see right-wing populists ex sort of accepting and tolerating a minority government. That is because the trend in Europe is that right-wing populists want to appear more mainstream, they want to appear more acceptable to voters, and that is why the German elections is so different, because that's not what the extremist AFD wants, but the general trend in Europe is to make the populists acceptable at the dining table. Do these results have any immediate impact on immigrants and migrants within Germany? Does this mean that we'll see fewer numbers in these eastern regions and maybe perhaps more numbers in the western? Or what's your projection on what this means for the lived experiences of immigrants? So there's some symbolic actions that are being taken now. So symbolically, um, a few hundreds of uh, asylum seekers who have committed crimes in Germany are being sent back to their countries. But if you look at the overall figures, it's just incredibly difficult to address the big numbers and to drive down the big numbers because on the European Union level, the system has been dysfunctional for so, such a long time. European Union leaders only now agreed on a reform of the asylum process. And the most difficult part in Germany is once refugees and asylum seekers have arrived, how to send them back. And that's the biggest, the weakest point, um, how to return asylum seekers to the countries where they come from. And there it's incredibly difficult to bring up the numbers so that it's actually, be, it's actually being felt on the ground um, by voters that the situation is changing and local constituencies don't have to use schools and other big public places and hotels to, to, to host big numbers of refugees. And I'm curious, do these, again, it's regional elections, not national elections, but do these election results have any impact on U.S.-Germany relations right now? Is there anything you can say about that? Yeah, the interesting part is that there is some kind of um, communication uh, in the uh, the way that populists try to 
communicate to their voters. And we see this in not only on the German US level, but also on the European US level. We see, for example, that Viktor Orban in Hungary recently said, we should make Europe great again, reflecting sort of campaign tactics from the United States. So we see that political trends in the United States about how elections are conducted, uh, sort of also spilling over to Europe. And that's a tendency that we see for a long time. On the official level, on the bilateral relations, um, it is the con issue of concern. Um, it's an issue of concern that Germany might not be the stable partner anymore in foreign policy. It might not be the stable partner anymore for Ukraine support, for example. So that it's an issue of concern, but it has no immediate impact on the relationship right now. This might change after the elections next year. What else are you watching right now? We've talked about migration. We've talked about the national elections next year. What do you have your eye on in Germany and German politics at this point in time? I think um, the political mood in Germany um, is just so depressed at the moment that it seems there needs to be a big, um, a, a big solution to some of the problems that Germans perceive a lack of investment. And one of the greatest challenges um, and breaks on these kinds of investments, spending money on defense in Europe, is the issue of debt and that the European countries, especially Germany, are so reluctant to take on debt and that on the European Union level, there are very strict criteria after the financial crisis on the debt level. And this is something which has to change in the future. So if you want, if you're hoping for progress in Germany and in Europe in terms of investment, spending and defense, that's not something where the United States is much more willing to, <laughs> to, to use the credit card. The question of will Germany, will the European Union take on more debt to invest in their own future is the crucial question of, uh, of the, for the next years. Leanne Fex, fellow for Europe at the Council on Foreign Relations, thank you so much for being here. We so appreciate thank your you. time. Thank you for the pleasure.